the Raw Spirits Festival, we shared a meal, we hung out, right? <laughs> and Steve, do you believe he's 60 years old? Look at this man. He looks amazing. So if you're here tonight and you're like, I don't know, sprouting, it's kind of a lot of work. You know, I'm kind of curious, but I don't know if it's for me. Just look at this man, okay? <laughs> so this is a great example of what uh, the raw foods lifestyle and bringing the very nutritious sprouts into your diet can do. So welcome, Steve Meyerwitz. Yay, thank you. <laughs> would, you would you like to learn about kitchen gardening? Yes. <laughs> well, I got into this when I was living here in New York, in Manhattan, and I got into it because I had severe allergies since I was six years old. And I uh, went to the best doctors and I got, I followed their protocol, I went to camp as a, as a kid, and I took the vials of injections and gave it to the nurse. I did what they told me to do. But they didn't cure me, and in fact, over the years, it got worse. I developed asthma. Um, my allergies started to expand. They were no longer narrow to cats and dogs, but now they were to grasses and ragweed and pollens and dust and uh, etc. So over time, I recognized that whatever they were doing, it wasn't working, and I started to have conversations in the waiting room with my fellow patients. Right? And I would ask them, how long have you been doing this? And, so, you know, 15 years. You know, oh, well, are you getting better? Oh, about the same. You know, <laughs> you know after a number of these conversations, you know, where, where I would share back and forth, well, I'm not getting better either. I started to realize, what are we really doing here? If, you know, and these were some of the best doctors. Right? These were allergists who were chairman of the allergy departments in major hospitals. So at one point, after my doctor, who thankfully for me, he had a bad bedside manner, right? Fairly common. This was back in the, set, in the 70s. So in 1975, my biologist with the bad bedside manner comes to me and he says, here, I got a present for you. I'm giving you some new medicine for you to try. This stuff is going to be great for you. All you got to do is sign this form over here. And, and it won't cost you a penny. And I thought, oh, gee, this guy's extra nice to me today. <laughs> you know? And of course, it didn't, you know, when I walked out of the office, you know, it didn't take long for me to realize that he was asking me to be a guinea pig for the pharmaceutical companies. And, and I wasn't getting paid for it. So um, I decided, you know what, I had enough of these guys. This was after I'd done my research. And I went out on my own, and I started reading. And, uh, you know, back in those days, I didn't quite have all the um, opportunities that you folks have today, in that we didn't have internet meetup groups, and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, we did, have, we did have lecturers like myself who'd come around and, and talk, and, and so I go, started to go to talks, and I started to read books, and I started fasting, and I started doing yoga, and I started doing uh, pranayama, which is kind of yoga of breathing. It's the science of breath. And, you know, in that, uh, one of the exercises is you, you close one nostril, right? How many of you know this? You close one nostril, right? And you breathe. Well, in my case, I close a nostril and... <coughs> No, no, the other side. So, you know, but I was trying. I was trying. I would do the other breaths, the, the deep breathing, Kapalabhati, the breath of fire. And I was, I was doing my yoga classes. I was doing juicing. I was doing fasting. I went totally vegan. I went totally raw, no dairy. You know, and I had a standard American diet. As a matter of fact, when I decided to do this, I had a final meal in Burger King. <laughs> Yeah. This, was, this, was, um, this was my lifestyle until I was 25, right? So, all right, one last meal, and um, fond memories of it, but um, I never turned back. After that, I went totally vegan, totally raw, juice therapy, fasting, 
Um, but the, the, the beauty of it is that within approximately 10 to 14 days, I was able to do the alternate nostril breathing. And, you know, I was rather surprised about that. I was really surprised because how could it be that what I was doing just by what I was reading was resolving my symptoms when almost 20 years worth of the best medical doctors around weren't able to do that for me. It just doesn't make sense. You know, I figured it's just a fluke, you know. But as time passed on, I got into what I was doing. And you know why I got into what I was doing? For the same reason why you folks are, are all here and, and, and on the path. I started to feel better. My health started to, I started to, to feel like I was better than I ever felt before. And I, can, I will tell you that probably I, I would attribute fasting and juicing as the number one and number two reasons for the, uh, uh, the results that I was getting. But the sprouting part, well, got into the sprouting part because I still had to eat. And organic food back in the day, in the middle 70s, was hard to find. So I was growing my own, right? I, I met with uh, Victoris Kolvinskis. Uh, he was lecturing in the area. I, I never really spent that much time with Dr. Ann Wigmore, although she was a, a major influence out there. But I, I had personal contact with Victoris Kovinskis just by going to his talks. And, <clears throat> you know, they were doing the wheatgrass and they were doing buckwheat and sunflower and they were doing sprouts. And I just started to do that. And then I said, well, this buckwheat, sunflower is pretty delicious stuff, makes a good salad, but well, what about some of the other things? And I started to experiment. And that's where broccoli came in. In those days, I was doing kale and cabbage uh, and radish. And these were things that were, you know, not really out there uh, back in, in 75. And uh, I just started to expand on the repertoire because for sprouting to work, you need something to grow basically in one to two weeks, two weeks maximum. All right? This is not backyard gardening. This is kitchen gardening. You want a fast turnaround. You want one harvest every week, ideally. So, uh, so I started to pick those seeds. And some seeds, like something like spinach, wow, that was unaffordable. That was like $50 a pound. You know? And I was looking at alfalfa, it was like $5 a pound. So that eliminated spinach. The other reasons why I would eliminate spinach was spinach was too slow. And then we had some other, uh, other seeds, like flax seeds. Well, flax seed is a wonderful a seed to have as a, in your diet, but actually the flax seed, actually uh, when you start to sprout it, creates a couple of problems. Number one, it's gelatinous seed, so it makes a goo, right? It requires special sprouting technique because of that. Number two, <clears throat> um, it's rich in oxalic acid, just like spinach is, and in the sprouting stage, we have a concentration of some of those nutrients, and in this case, you could taste the bitterness of the uh, oxalic acid coming out of the flax. So that's why you won't see flax seed on my sprouting list, even though it's a wonderful seed to include in the diet as a non-sprouting uh, seed. So, um, you know, and then I started to get into bean sprouts. You know, and, and here, coming out of my sprout bag is, is bean sprouts, right? So, uh, just a bunch of beans. Uh, we have lentils and mung and uh, chickpeas and green peas and red lentils and green Lentils, French lentils, you, you can speak French to them. So, um, but it's in a bag, right? Now, back in the 70s, I was doing jars. And I would carry jars around to my workshops. And inevitably, the jars would break somewhere in transportation. And then I'd have a, a different kind of spout, sprout, a, a, a glass crystal sprout. So that wasn't going to work. So... That's when I invented the fabric sprout bag as a way to carry sprouts with you. And now you can use a sprout bag to actually go, on, uh, go hiking on trails. Uh, I've, I've sold these to boaters 
and to uh, long distance Appalachian trail hikers. And it's a, all you need is to carry your beans with you and your sprout bag and wet them in a stream. And while you're walking or, or out, out in your boat for days, you're going to be growing fresh green food. Now, the, the sprout bag is mostly for grains and beans. I like to, uh, uh, I like to um, limit what I grow in here to the legume family and the grain and the bean family. So that would be wheat and, and rye and spelt and kamut and um, the uh, green peas and the lentils and the mung, anything uh, in the bean family, the chickpea, the whole green pea because these are basically beans with a tail on them. And these bags are just are wonderful to use. Because all you do is you, you take a bag. These are made out of hemp. This bag's been around for many years. They can be used over a thousand times. The, the hemp is very sturdy. You just take the bag and you dip it in the water, a pot of water, and you leave it in there for about 30 seconds. And then you pull it out, hang it up on a hook. It's going to stop dripping in about five minutes. So, if, you know, I usually hang it on the cabinet knob above my sink or a cup hook, all right, wherever you want to hang it to drip. And if, you, if that's not a convenient spot for you, no problem. After it stops dripping, five minutes later, just lay it in the dish rack or put it in a bowl on the side of the sink, and you're done. 30 seconds in the morning. 30 seconds in the evening. That's all it takes. And, no, it doesn't have to be dark. Um, but this is sort of a dark environment in and of itself. This is a newer bag. This is, you can tell this is a bag. I don't know how many years old this is, but this bag is many years old. You can see there's a color difference. This is a slightly newer bag. And the, the interesting thing about hemp is that they cure it out in the field. So the color will change from season to season depending on the amount of sunshine and the amount of moisture in the air. So they can sometimes come out a little browner and sometimes they come out a little grayer. But the wonderful thing is that when you have a bag that, that has all of these, um, these, these pores, let's see, a new bag. A new bag, you can see it a little bit better. You could, there are pores there. All right, I actually designed the the, the weave so that there'd be a proper breathing. So this bag can't retain moisture. And that's a, uh, an improvement over jars. Jars actually retain moisture. And they don't have very good air circulation because you only have the mouth at the top. But a sprout bag is breathing from all sides. right? So if you forget to rinse your jar, that jar um, will eventually retain that moisture and retain that air. It's a perfect environment for the growth of mold and mildew. But if you forget to rinse your sprout bag, the contents of the sprout bag will simply dehydrate. It won't mold because there's just too much air and there is no retention of water. About the, this question, your question was uh, mold, bacteria concern, alfalfa. Um, there, there are two criteria uh, that you have that are the top two reasons why people get into trouble doing this kind of kitchen gardening. And that is um, using jars because I promise you no one ever designed a jar to be a gardening tool. It's for storage of dried seeds and beans. So use the right equipment number one. Number two, using seeds that are not designed for, not intended for sprouting. And okay, so you're, when, when you buy the already grown sprouts in the store, if you look on the bottom, sometimes they look uh, kind of uh, rotten or old or brown. That is a problem when somebody else is the gardener and they deliver it to the store early before it's mature because they want it to mature on the shelf, but it's not really being uh, watered or cared for properly when it's sitting on the shelf. And it may sit on that shelf 
for a, a, a long time, which is well beyond its maturity date. And when you come along, and it's already old, and it's not been cared for, it's going to be in poor condition. So the best way to go about this kind of uh, diet is to grow it yourself. It's certainly simple enough to do it. And the, 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 the grains and the beans and the seeds that we get in health food stores, for the most part, those seeds are for cooking. And the, uh, the even alfalfa <coughs> seed that sits in the bulk bins, those bulk bins are exposed to the moisture in the air, the humidity in the air. And, and, and seeds are hydroscopic. So they're absorbing the water from the air and that diminishes the percentage of germination. And, and so bulk bin seeds are notorious for being bad sprouters. And I, and I want to share with you uh, something else. If you want to go buy oats in the health food store, well, the health food store oats, they're for cooking. If you want to sprout, a, sprout your oats, you're going to have to buy them with the husks on them. But we can't get those in health food stores because you can't cook oats that way because it's too chewy. The, hu the husks are like woody in, uh, in texture, right? So you've got to go buy those from an agricultural supply store, the, the kind that feeds horses. That's where you can get your oats and your barley, but not likely to get it organic there. So where do you have to go? You, we're, we're forced to, get, uh, to go to uh, sprouting, sp sprouting companies. And there are some health food stores who carry sprouting seed brands, right? I've got one of the brands. There's another brand out there. Uh, and so uh, uh, health food stores that are aware about this will sell packaged sprouting seeds, and it'll say sprouting all over it. Just like a company is proud to, to tell you on the package that they are organic. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Just like they're, they're proud to tell you that their product is organic, they're also proud to tell you that their product is sprouting grade seed. So when you see that, and if you turn around on the back side, you'll see a percentage of germination, you'll see an expiration date, just like with gardening seeds. That's when you know that you've got sprouting grade seeds. And you'll get this in better health food stores that are conscious about this. Uh, otherwise, it's the internet where you, know, you get sprouting companies. And if you look in, in, any, one of my, in any one of my sprouting books, uh, the back has a whole list of all the different seed companies that are out there. So this is the best way to ensure that you're gonna have good results. Use a professionally designed sp uh, sprouting equipment and use quality sprouting seeds and then uh, you'll have the least amount of, of trouble. So sprout bag, uh, will grow anything, it will grow alfalfa, but alfalfa actually has a green leaf, right? So when, when, the, uh, when the sprout comes out, this is not alfalfa, alfalfa is a green leafy sprout, right? Something like this, this is sunflower. And so it needs to get green and it has leaves. But if you look at the bean sprouts, well, the bean sprouts, they don't have leaves. They're just a bean with a tail on them. So they don't need to green up. They don't need light at this stage. So the bean sprouts can grow in a dark environment like a bag. They can grow all mixed up and jumbled. But if you want to, if you want to grow green sprouts, then you're going to need to grow them in a vertical environment and this is one very good vertical sprouter. There, uh, it's not the only one out there, but it's a popular one. And here, the sunflower, is, again, there it is, with its tail on it, with its roots. And yes, you can eat the roots because the roots never touch soil. This is a soil-free process. And the, the, uh, uh, the, the sprout actually kind of grows grows up, uh, pops off its hull, and then continues to open its, and spread its leaves. That's when it's at its prime. Now, if you wait for a second leaf to come through and you have two leaves, then it's, it's actually past peak. So you want to get it. Now, now, here's what's really fascinating about, uh, uh, about these, these sprouts. 
is that at, this, at, at peak stage, which is anywhere between five and 10 days, the nutrient density of this plant is far superior to the, the same vegetable, the same plant, when it's grown out in the backyard garden. So you have something like broccoli, which, ah, I don't want to, all right, I'm going to be, I'm going to live dangerously now and I'm going to pick this up and show you the fountain of water that works underneath. So that's the water that's actually working to spread up. Now, you would change that water once a day, but uh, once you become really professional at it, you can actually let, it, let the water go for a second day, and you can even treat the water if you want a little bit with something like hydrogen peroxide to keep it a little, keep the bacteria count down. And I do that because I'm experienced with this, I know what I'm doing, and I'm frequently traveling, right? So back home now, I've got my automatic sprouter running because for the next workshop next week, right? Because I can't start it when I'm away. So, so I, I know what I'm doing and I can actually make uh, the, uh, the sprouters work successfully without changing the water every single day. But I do recommend that you change the water every day to keep it clean. And it's just a matter of pouring the, the old water out and pouring new water in. It doesn't take that long. And these particular devices do the watering for you. So that's one less thing for, to tax our busy brains of what we have to remember. And that's a, a, a nice, this is what I call, you know, we designed this for mainstream America. You know, the, the people who didn't want to do anything and wanted to have it done for them. It's not quite uh, work, workload free, but it does water for you. And it does also soak the seeds for you. You don't have to soak them in a jar first. Your question, your question. Well, a actually, um, slightly acid water is, is preferred. So um, if you have a water ionizer that, that, that where you can adjust the pH, they like it slightly acid. Um, if you're using water uh, from your household water, that's pretty much pH neutral. And, and that's also OK. So it's not a major point. The sprouts seem to grow happily in, uh, in either pH uh, number. So it's not a major point, but it's a minor one. Now my question was, do you have to soak the seed for the plants? So yeah, yeah. Now over here, oh, it just stopped. So I can show you, this is a mix of, on my left over here, it's radish. That's baby radish growing. And on my right over here is baby broccoli. Now I want to tell you something special about broccoli because broccoli has, uh, has a, a wealth of glucosinolates in them. And one of them, which forms in the mouth, is called, you see by the way, there's, there's another level down here. Growing. So we can, we can grow a double decker, you know. It's like having a duplex apartment, you know. So the, uh, the broccoli was actually tested uh, at Johns Hopkins University and they, they found uh, that it's a, it's a rich source of glucosinolates. And glucosinolates, um, one of them, when you, when you get it in your mouth uh, and it interacts with our saliva, forms sulforaphane. And sulforaphane interrupts the growth of tumors, cancerous tumors, malignant tumors. So it, it's basically, it, it, it's an interrupter. So, and the amount, the levels of glucosinolates in the, the, the broccoli plant that's five days old is 50 to 100 times, this is their quote from their study, 50 to 100 times more uh, dense, greater, than the same broccoli if you grow it in your backyard to maturity with, with that we commonly eat broccoli in. So that's the benefit, that's the benefit of uh, of, of these baby plants. It's the nutrient density. And I, I want to spend just another minute on, um, I'll come back to your, 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 your questions uh, shortly. I want to spend just another minute on um, why this is. Because you know, the, 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 the techniques for 
you know, how to use the equipment or how to grow the sprouts. That's, that's fairly straightforward uh, stuff. A little bit of gardening skill. Uh, it's like anything. It's like, you know, if, if, um, if, if you're in your pre-raw days you were baking bread. How many of you got the perfect bread the first time out? No, you did. We got one. We got one. <laughs> but for most of us, it takes two or three times to get that bread to come out just right. And maybe it's going to take that with you as a gardener doing this kind of kitchen gardening. It might take a few times just to get the hang of it. Um, so don't be discouraged uh, if it doesn't look be as beautiful as these, say, for the first time out. But, you know, it, I, I, there's a lot, of, a lot of people who have trouble growing a good-looking lawn. Am I right? You know, so, so gardening has its, its challenges, but I can promise you this kind of gardening is way easier than uh, the outdoor backyard gardening. And the, the, the variety of, of flavors uh, is, uh, is, is quite large. If um, my handy little sprout chart here, you can actually see in color the, the photographs of the different varieties, and there are 33 varieties here. So um, everything from uh, radish and cabbage and broccoli and sunflower and, and buckwheat and uh, clover and alfalfa. Uh, clover and alfalfa, that's something that we would never eat, right? Cows and horses eat that, but we don't eat that because if you go out to the field to eat what they eat, it's too chewy, it's too woody, it's uh, uh, ligenous, it's got uh, too much texture to it. But if you're going to grow it for five to seven days, it's very delicate and very succulent. And wow, the, uh, the, the, the nutrition in this, um, if you look at some of the, the studies um, in, in my book, um, alfalfa is our, our finest source of saponins. Saponins is a, a, a phytochemical that has been uh, shown to um, reduce the, uh, uh, the uh, LDL, the bad cholesterol, and increase the HDL, the good cholesterol. So cardiovascular uh, disease is improved in a diet that's rich in these phytochemicals, this particular group of phytochemicals <coughs> called saponins. And uh, alfalfa and clover and fenugreek sprouts are the best sources uh, we have of them. Um, and then uh, isoflavones is uh, another uh, category that's uh, used for uh, 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 hot flashes, women's problems, uh, osteo uh, um, osteoporosis, uh, and those are found uh, in clover and in soybean uh, sprouts. So um, as, you, as you look at not just the ABC vitamins in, in these sprouts, if you start to look at the antioxidant levels, and if you look at the bioflavonoids and the glucosinolates and the isoflavones and the, the saponins, and you, you start to, uh, to look at the, these whole plant compounds that have therapeutic benefit, then you start to realize that these are actually functional foods. They can actually have a therapeutic benefit to eating a diet rich in these. And because they're so concentrated, it's a little bit, it's comparable to um, a vitamin capsule, right? Where you have um, 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C, well, that took a lot of oranges or a lot of rose hips uh, or a lot of uh, peppers to get that much vitamin C into a capsule. You couldn't consume that much food to get that 1,000 milligrams. It would be very hard. But when you take a juice, well, uh, if you wanted provitamin A, the kind you would get from, it's carotene, it's provitamin A, the kind you'd get from carrots, say. Well, you can't eat a pound of carrots, but you can juice a pound of carrots. You can juice a pound of carrots into a glass, and you can drink that glass, and you can get the provitamin A from that glass, and, and the digestibility of that juice is almost instant because your stomach doesn't have to break down all those carrots. And uh, an assimilation of the plant is superior to common vegetables. If you add to that benefit the fact that it's a living food, it's highly bioactive, right? It's literally effervescing in its enzymes. We have some Curlian photographs. You can see a, a Curlian photograph of a blade of grass in, in this book. And, and what you see in, in there 
is that the aura, which is essentially the electromagnetic field of, of that living green food, is expansive, right? It's out there, and it's colorful, and it's expansive, right? And if you were to take a picture of uh, a common vegetable, like a carrot, um, that aura is not as large. So these baby living plants that are, are, are so wonderful because of that bioactivity, because of that enzymatic uh, act activity, and because of that essentially that um, electromagnetic energy that you get from this living food. Because that electromagnetic energy recharges our batteries. Right? That, that's when, when people are sick and um, uh, terminally ill, one of the reasons that they fail, that they lose their battle, is because they're, they're losing their energy. They're on a downward spiral. They can't get enough energy to stop the downward spiral and to come on back up. So sometimes, right, in, re in religious circles, you have laying on of hands, spiritual healing, right? What does that do? That's somebody coming and recharging their batteries. Right? But the other way to do it is to do it with a highly energetic food form. And these baby plants are, are one way to do that. Not only that, it's about, it's the ultimate local agriculture. Right? Every week of the year, a new harvest. Twelve months a year, whether you live in New York, whether you live in Atlanta, whether you live in Alaska, you can get this fresh food. The economy of it is, you know, I know that there's uh, mescaline lettuce, mescaline, mescaline mix, right? How many of you buy mescaline mix lettuce? It's good stuff, right? How much money does it cost? Eleven a pound? That's even higher than I heard. That's for organic, right? Well, you want organic. This organic, these organic greens, just as good, in fact, superior to mescaline mix. Make your own mix. 50 cents, 75 cents a pound, if you do it yourself. So this is why, if you want to be a, a, a raw foodist at the top of your game, start incorporating these living foods in your diet. The gardening part is not that, is not that hard, and the rewards and the benefits are absolutely amazing. And that's why when many people only discover this when they're too ill and they have to recover from some illness, right? Our, our wheatgrass friend over here, right? they only start to get into wheatgrass therapy when they're too sick and the doctor sent them home to fill out their last will and testament. Now they get into the wheatgrass therapy because wheatgrass recharges their batteries. It detoxifies their, their liver. Um, it, it rejuvenates the bloodstream. It, uh, cleanses the colon and when you start to get back some liver function and clean your bloodstream and get this kind of high energy uh, bioactivity into, into your cells, you start to wake up and you start to climb up that ladder again. And, and that's why so many people are, 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 are benefiting from wheatgrass therapy, from this living food therapy. How much time do we have? What time is it? Okay, so we're going to take uh, like 10, 15 minutes of, of questions, and I'm going to start. The first hand I saw up was back there, and I'll get all of you. Uh, temperature of mm. the area which you live in in order to grow this, because you said you can grow it anywhere, but the one thing that varies in all these different places is the temperature. Well, act, these, these foods grow in any kitchen. Uh, so uh, average kitchen temperature and average kitchen light is suitable. So a New York kitchen would work. What's the temperature? Because like, I live in a loft, and my loft in the winter is you know, they, below, you know. They, I'll tell you the temperature they love. They love 70 degrees. 70 degrees? So if you can keep it between 68 and uh, 75, they're very happy. It will grow at a colder temperature, but it, it just, just grows slower. All right. It grows more slowly. OK, so you had a question. I'm trying to go in order here. You had a question, and then you. Wheatgrasses and, and things that are dry, like there's certain commercial dried brands that come in canisters. Commercial, in in this book. 
you will find all of the finest dried wheatgrasses. I actually discuss about how do you compare the dried wheatgrass with the fresh wheatgrass? How do you compare the outdoor grown wheatgrass with the indoor grown wheatgrass? How do you compare the frozen wheatgrass with the fresh wheatgrass? I go through all of these comparisons. There are some fine, and I go through the different companies in here. There are, some, there are several companies that are cited and discussed, and not just a paragraph, but a few pages on each company. So you can get a sense, well, do I want to buy from this country? Do I feel uh, confident about this, this, this company? And how does this company compare to the other companies I'm reading about? And there are, if you want to get, my, I don't pick favorites in, in, in my book, because I'm, I'm kind of neutral. But if you want to get a sense of my favorites, you can look on my web store and see which ones I've picked. But there's a lot of value in the dehydrated wheatgrass. I can tell you the frozen wheatgrass, there are stories in that book from people who've never used fresh wheatgrass. They've only used frozen wheatgrass for their healing. And um, so that's pretty impressive. And there are even stories in there about dogs using wheatgrass for, for cancer. And dogs, you know, there's no faith healing going on there. There's no placebo effect. They're getting better. You know, there's some wonderful stories in there by breeders, you know, having, getting visited by the um, veterinarians and uh, the veterinarian being shocked that the dog's still alive. You know, so um, uh, frozen wheatgrass works. There are some excellent dehydrated wheatgrasses out there. Freeze-dried is the best form. There are some excellent products out there. To, and, and they're concentrated because it takes like 45 ounces of fresh juice to make one ounce of juice crystals. So you've got this tremendous concentration, whereas in fresh juice, uh, fresh wheatgrass juice is 95% water. So, you know, there is such a thing as progress since since Ann Wigmore was on the scene in the 1960s and 70s, we've learned some new things. We've got some new products out there. There's, there's more than one wheatgrass. In the, in the, the best companies work like, like religious priests over their wheatgrass to keep the bioactivity. And, and to, an ex, to the extent that they can in any non-fresh form, um, it's, it's, it's pretty uh, high quality stuff. But you can try it, check it out for yourself. Uh, I wanted to ask you, because I noticed here you talked about your, uh, the, growing the wheatgrass with or without soil. So can you spend a minute just talking about the technique and, because and, I thought it had to grow in the soil. Well, okay. Now, uh, back in Ann Wigmore's day, everything had to grow in soil, and everything had to, uh, in the kitchen we had a compost bucket with worms in it. And that was all fine and good for the diehards. If you were dying of cancer, you were going to do whatever she said. But when I came on the scene, I decided that I, this is really good stuff. And I want to get people who are not terminally ill, but who are hurting. And so I want to find a way to make this a little bit easier. And as you know, all plants and vegetables grow great in soil. That's the natural environment. But <clears throat> none of you here would go out and grow alfalfa sprouts in soil, right? So you can grow them either way. With, this is wheatgrass. Let's take a look. I haven't done this yet. This is wheatgrass. You can juice this part. Most people don't because it's glutinous, right? That's the, that's the grain left over. Are you losing any nutrients because it's not in soil? I have, uh, it, it, back in my wheatgrass book, there's a, a lab study comparing with soil, without soil. They're both, both, both basically the same, and here's the reason. These root systems here, they're only one inch deep, right? But if you go out to the outdoor garden where you're growing wheatgrass, they're a foot and a half long. Those mature roots can convert the minerals in the soil and get a, an uptake that mineral value. They can convert from inorganic to organic. But at, at, a, at a one inch root system, we're not really going to get that much conversion. So although if you want to go the extra step, your, your grass will probably look a little better, grow a little taller. But generally speaking, the juice is about the same. And you have to make a decision, is the extra labor worth it to you? I would rather get you know, 20 ounces into me every week 
versus 10 ounces into me every week. And if those 20 ounces were 5% less nutritious, I'm still doing better by getting 20 in over 10. Does and that's the answer. Does it taste as good? Actually, it tastes better. It's more of a neutral taste. The outdoor grass tastes the best. It's very neutral. It doesn't have that intense sweet um, shot uh, to it. Is there a lot more chlorophyll in wheatgrass than other sprouts? Or? Is there a lot more chlorophyll in wheatgrass than in other sprouts? Actually, the leading sprout with chlorophyll is alfalfa. The amount of chlorophyll in wheatgrass is anywhere between a half of, of 1% to 1%. So, the, and don't forget, there's only 95% of fresh wheatgrass juice is, <clears throat> is water. But um, what we're finding in, um, even in the dehydrated grasses is that the maximum chlorophyll you're going to get is 1%. So, the, it's an old wives' tale that it is that wheatgrass is 70% chlorophyll, and that the uh, and, and that the chlorophyll levels in wheatgrass are what are the primary therapeutic um, advantage of wheatgrass. The primary therapeutic advantage of wheatgrass is its growth hormones. This stuff, this is the secret factor that if 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 you grab <coughs> if you grab this book you can actually get to the history of wheatgrass and you get to the, the scientists because interestingly enough back in the in the f late 30s <clears throat> and in the early 40s you could buy a bottle of wheatgrass powder in every pharmacy in North America you could even go to Canada and get it that was because they uh, they discovered this they were f making it for cows <clears throat> as a supplement and <clears throat> Where did my drink go? There it is. So they were making it for cows. And then as a, uh, as a side business, they made it for people and put it in pharmacies. That fell apart uh, after World War II. But um, they were found, they, the reason why they started doing this is that they found that they could reactivate the growth uh, of these animals, of these sick animals, with wheatgrass juice. So it's the growth factor in wheatgrass juice that, it's, that is its most potent form. And if you want to see some proof to that, you've got, only got to look at this. There's a guy in Australia, a doctor in Australia, who makes wheat, a wheatgrass extract. It's an alcohol extract, like you make echinacea extract or you make ginseng extract. He makes it an extract. In the process of making an alcohol extract, the, the, the chlorophyll is neutralized. It's lost. So there's no chlorophyll in this product. But he's still using it. He puts it in a cream. He puts it in a spray. He, he's still using it on his skin patients. And you can see some before and after photographs on my website. Bef you know, eczema, psoriasis, and it works. So, and that's with no chlorophyll. So there are other factors in wheatgrass uh, that make it so, uh, so pure. So I think we've got maybe... Um, can you grow it in the, that thing, the wheatgrass? No? You can grow wheatgrass in, the, in this automatic sprouter. Okay. But if you want the kind of volume uh, this this uh, this three tray unit. This is my um, invention. It's uh, my wheatgrass grower. It starts as three trays. It can go up to ten. So if you need more grass, you just grow more grass. Um, and and you need you tend to need something like if you're trying to cure a terminal illness, you're going to need up to a quart of wheatgrass a day. And you're not going to take that through the mouth. You're going to take that rectally. You're going to go get a colonic. You're going to have the colonic therapist um, implant the quart of wheatgrass after you've been after you've cleansed your colon. That's a whole other. That's the Roto Rooter lecture. Catch me next week. <laughs> okay. I don't know if I can do all of your questions, but um, uh, we'll start. Uh, you, sir. Okay. We're going to have to stop. And one more question after you. Would these be would these cruciferous vegetables, these baby cruciferous vegetables like radish? be more superior. And, and they would, and they would. Um, I, I don't want to get anybody wet, but I'm going to hand you a radish sprout, okay? One radish sprout. Just taste that and tell me how it compares to radishes that, that you eat. Yeah, it's actually quite, it's quite intense. The flavor doesn't come from a vacuum. 
Flavor is, is represented by nutrient value and plant compounds. And if you've got a lot of flavor, if you've got a lot of color, if you've got an aroma, you've got a food that's rich. And when you're looking at iceberg lettuce, no color, no aroma, no flavor, no nutrition. Um, it doesn't require a lot of light. How does it get, it's tinted, how, do, how does it uh, get it, why is it tinted? You know, they, they, I, I perfected this sprouter after it came out. I didn't do the initial uh, in, invention. Um, the tinting uh, doesn't seem to stop the greening. It doesn't require that much light to get it green. Uh, and if you want to read about the plastic, by the way, I have a whole thing on my website, sproutman.com. You can uh, click on it and read what kind of plastic it is and uh, all that uh, uh, good stuff. Okay, one last question, our final question in the back, sir. Yeah, as far as growing hydroponically, um, is it the same for like the sunflower greens and the buckwheat lettuce? Is the nutritional value value the same? Because you said with the wheatgrass, it's pretty it's pretty equal. But I, I've read in other places that soil actually is more nutritious. It, uh, like I said earlier, the uh, uh, soil is always more nutritious. Everything will grow better in soil because that's the natural environment. But when you're growing a vegetable for only five to ten days. There's, there's not a lot of uh, uh, maturity in the root systems to really do a, a significant amount of uptaking of, and conversion of organic min inorganic minerals into organic minerals. So it's more of a structural support at that early stage. And so if you want to make your life easier uh, and get more of this into your diet, then I recommend just go with the hydroponic process because it's less, uh, it's, it's less time consuming, and it's way more important to get the food into your body on a regular basis than it is to have that extra 5% nutritional advantage that, that, that might be there. I would rather drink um, a fresh vegetable juice twice a day and have that second juice sit in my refrigerator for the, the six hours, because I know how to get it really cold and keep it keep it stable, I'd rather have that second drink than not have that second drink. Because if I had to go clean those vegetables and clean the juicer and go through the process of juicing, I would never get that second drink. So I'm compromising. I'm, we're making a little bit of a trade-off to, to get that second drink. But I think it's a really good trade-off. But so I want to say I really applaud all of you for coming out. and furthering your education, and building community so that you're not weird because you eat different than your neighbors. You're doing something that your neighbors don't know about. So I want to thank all of you for coming out and continuing to expand on your skills. That's why I always say use pills, use, use your skills and not the pills. And, <laughs> and, and let's stop treating our stomachs like a compost and start treating it like a garden. Thank you, Thank you all very much.